Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? I love the Lord. I love Jesus. How many of you have uh, really had a life change from Jesus in your life? Isn't it awesome to know that God's not dead, but he's alive? Amen? You know, I've been teaching on Tuesdays. Uh, I do a leadership training course every Tuesday from noon to one. And I've been doing a study on the generations, on the lost generation, which is uh, the folks that went through uh, the wars and uh, through the Great Depression, and then the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials, and the Z generation. And you know, there's one thing that can unify every one of those generations. It really is only one thing, and that is the move of the Holy Spirit in their life. You cannot deny when God has touched you supernaturally in your life. And you see, it doesn't matter whether you're 85 years old. And what's really cool is in that class, there's somebody that's, I think, 83 years old, all the way down to all the teenagers, which are the, the Gen Zers. And truthfully, on Tuesday, I asked, how many of you were touched by the Holy Spirit at some point and you can't deny it? And every one of them raised their hands. Do you know what that showed? Is that the Holy Spirit is the only one that can transcend generations with the impartation of heaven that will transform somebody's life. And I want you to realize, if you've never experienced a true, genuine touch from the Holy Spirit, where you can say, man, I, I truly was touched by heaven itself, I want you to know today can be your day. Right. Turn to someone and say, I want a touch from God. <laughs> At the end of the service, the prayer team's going to be up here. They'll lay hands on you, minister to you in the Holy Spirit. God wants you to know that he's alive and not dead. Religion will never hold you. Can I hear an amen or oh my? Only Jesus truly can change a life. Today we're getting really close. This is the year of... If you are a guest in the house, we have a theme that goes the whole year. And man, this year has been so good. It's been literally all over the nation how God wants to take you from where you are to another level in the spirit, to another level in your finances, to another level in your family. We can go through all the different levels we've talked about this whole year. But now we're creeping into the last few weeks. And I want to make sure that we are stimulated to continue to grow. That we cannot, we cannot make a choice to stay backwards. We've got to move forward. Can I hear an amen? amen. Turn to someone and say, I've got to move forward. Backwards is not an option. Stagnant is not an option. I've got to move forward. What's really cool about all of our relationship with God, it's different. You know, some of you are 50 years in the gospel and you're just starting. Some of you are just starting and you're just starting. Let's, did you see that? That wasn't good. Some of you are 20 years in the gospel and where you are with Jesus now, man, is where you've never been before. You know, every one of us are at a different growth plate when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. But the design of God is that we never stand still. The design of God is that we're always maturing, that we're always in this maturation process to where we're not staying where we are, but moving closer to Christ. That I can look like Christ, act like Christ, speak like Christ, think like Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, that's the awesome part about spiritual growth. We all start somewhere, but you can't stay there. Amen. And that's what God's passion is for your life. 2019 has been all about that. How God wants to take you on this adventure of spiritual growth. This adventure of growth with your family. This adventure with growth in prayer. This adventure with growth in the word. This adventure with growth with your finances. This adventure with growth in your ministry. So that every portion of your being is transformed by the end of the year. Sadly enough, there are many that are going to end 2019 and be the exact same person. They will. You know, I've heard it said, well, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, last I knew you weren't a dog. Last I knew you were a child of God. Last I knew you were created in the image of God himself. Last I knew that you're a brilliant individual because you're in the house of the Lord. Last I knew about God for you. Nothing can be against you. I want you to realize God wants you to grow. Turn to someone and say, you got to grow. Amen. Next level is so important. You know, the Bible talks about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and I'm not going to be very long this morning, but I just wanted to share what God placed on my spirit. 
And it says this, for we are God's workmanship. You know what I love about that is it shows the personage of our God. You know, every one of us are so intentional. God intentionally made you. You were not made intentionally a thousand years ago. You were made intentionally today. You are not an accident. He said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. What I love about workmanship was, you know, when my dad was a carpenter and uh, the guy could, listen, I I can tell you this. My dad never made anything half-baked. When he did it, it was always amazing. And the creation of it was phenomenal. Now let me tell you about my great gift set. When I was in high school, has anybody, did anybody take art in high school? Yeah, me too. And so, I, I, I'm not an artist. In fact, if you want me to draw you a person, I'm going to draw you a stick figure. That's about the best I can do. And, uh, you know, if you, you have a doodle, my doodlings don't look like anything that should have been doodled. It just doesn't make sense. I try my best, but it's not working. You see, as a, as a, as a creation person, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little, little challenged. So here I am in 10th grade, I believe it was 10th grade, and I went to the art class, and it's time to make uh, some clay. Has anybody ever done clay work? Yes, I did it. So, you know, I got on the, I got on the what do they call that? The potter's wheel with the big stone. And, you know, you start kicking, you start pushing, and all of a sudden it starts moving. And they hand you a chunk of clay, and you're supposed to get it a little bit wet here or there. And you go in the middle. And, and then, then you start to start. So, I, you know, my mom was in first service. And I decided I was going to make my mom a, uh, a little creamer thing. You know the little creamer thing you put on your table? You know, it's time for coffee and stuff. So uh, I, I'm starting to push the thing and starting to play with it a little bit and getting a little of this hard stuff out. And I'm moving it around and I start raising it up. And all of a sudden it goes, it just flattened right out. And I said, well, that's not good. So I started kicking it again and started moving it again. And I start recreating it. It start rises again. And, and the teacher came over to me. She says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm making my mother a creamer. She said, what does it look like? I said, a creamer. She said, what does it look like? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so here I am. I'm trying. I'm peeking over to the other people's work. And, and I finally get it going up a little bit. And I look over and somebody had a, 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 a handle on theirs. So I put a handle on mine. And, and then I figured you got to be able to pour something. So I, I pushed it over the edge and I created a little spout on this end. And then they fired it up and it was blue as, you know, it, it collapsed a little. And um, you know what I found out? in first service, my mother comes to first service, is that she threw it away. (laughs) I think I'm going to go to counseling. (laughs) The realization is I handed it to my mother. Her statement was, thank you, honey. What is it? (laughs) No wonder she threw it away. Why? Well, because I just, I, I, that was not my gift. But I've got great news for you today, that you are God's gift, that God is a creator, and that God said, you are my workmanship. God has never made junk. Can I hear an amen? God didn't just make you to throw you away. God didn't make you to have you collapse. God created you with his perfection, and he made you so fearfully and wonderfully made so that when people would look at you, they would say that you are a a jar that is used and blessed, and God wants you on his table. Isn't it amazing to realize how God chose to make you exactly the way you are? You know, my, ma- my, my, my wife was going to be kind of mean last night. Um, and, and that was, we had our staff Christmas party. And uh, I was giving the gifts to the children. And she took a photograph over my back. You were being very mean. You show me the picture afterwards. Because I pay all, uh, listen, I pay extra to my barbers to lie to me. I guess... Uh, from the picture last night, I'm getting a little thin. So she shows me this picture. She goes, well, it's undeniable now. And I said, thanks. She said, but we can buy that spray if you want. <laughs> yeah. What I love about God is that if God needed me to have more hair, he would have created me with more hair. I'm going to talk to him about that. 
But God created you with your height. He created you with your size. Have you ever been around somebody, you know, that, that can, they could eat six pies and not gain a pound, but you take one spoon of ice cream and pull, everything explodes. It's just not right. You know, we look at people and we wonder, why am I not like them? Why am I not like, because God didn't make you like them. God made you like you. He didn't need you to be them. He needed you to be you. He made you as tall as you are. He made you as buff as you are. <laughs> or not, you know, we were walking, my wife and I were walking in the mall one day. She reached over, she grabbed my arm. She goes, where did it go? And I, I don't know. She goes, no, I'm talking about your muscles. She, she, I know she's sweet, but she has a mean streak, so be careful. <laughs> but every one of us are created so different. And what God wants you to know today, that you are his workmanship. Oh my goodness, he loves you so much. He designed you. He made you. You are perfect to him. You know, I, I sometimes get bothered again. My, my son Cody, he loves sneakers and he buys really expensive sneakers. Sells some of them, keeps some of them. And you know, I, every once in a while, I'd love to trade with him. But God created him with a 12 foot and he created me with an eight and a half wide. I don't understand it. But you see, you come into trouble immediately when you start comparing yourself to somebody else. God made you the way you are, as tall as you are, with the color of hair you have, with a lot of hair or little hair. Come on now. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are important. You are his workmanship. And God designed you. I don't care what anybody else has to say about you. God designed you. You are amazing. Amen. Turn to someone and say, you are amazing. Come on, tell somebody, you're amazing. Some of you live with the person you just said that to and said, yeah, they are. <laughs> I want you to realize that you are his workmanship. The Bible then goes on to say that you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah. You know what's amazing is that God created you with skills and talents and abilities that other people don't have. You know, something that's easy for you is hard for me. You know, somebody came over my house and they were helping me with our, our tub is leaking. And uh, they came over to the, the house and they started looking and, and looking at this and looking and, and they said, yeah, and, and they gave their professional opinion. Well, I gave my professional opinion from the kitchen because that's about as far as my skill set goes. You know, I'm just not, I'm not somebody that's going to work on tubs. And listen, if I'm going to work on electricity, you better have 911 ready on your telephone because I know I'm going to electrocute myself. Why? Well, because I've been created for good works, but knowing who you are is so important. God is placed within you. Oh man, isn't that amazing to realize? God has placed within you specific gifts, talents, likes, and even dislikes that are in your life th so that he can use your life to touch other people. You know, I always tip my hat to those who work uh, with the disabled. You know, it, it, I, I, uh, especially the, the mentally challenged. And I look at that and I, I say, what a phenomenal gift. You know, one day I decided I was going to go into the children's wing. And I realized, not my gift. I did not last long as those children are running around and I wanted to snatch them up. <laughs> not my gift. Knowing your gift is so important. Knowing your talents are so, see, you have been that fearfully, I, I know I said it once, but I'm going to say it again. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are intricately put together, and God designed you, for you are his workmanship. You are not an accident. You are not just making it by, but he's given you the height. He's given you the width. He's given you the mouth. He's given you the love. He's given you the passion. He's given you the gifts. He's given you the talents. Why? Because God needs you to work for him. You know, you can make all the money in the world. You can be millions and millions of dollars in the bank, or you can live in a box. Or you can be a middle-class individual that has a nice house, a nice car, two cars, two-car garage, three kids, and a dog named Louie. 
Has anybody ever had a dog named Louie? We do, we have it. Ah, come on now. I love you. Dog named Louie. All of that, you can have all of that, but watch. That's not what you were created for. You and I were created with all the gifts and the talents and, and all the specialties so that we could work for him. This is the challenge of the new level. Some of you are finding that your spiritual walk is stymied. Some of you are finding that your spiritual walk is stunted and you're actually a little bored. And I'll tell you why you're bored. Because you're not doing anything for God. See, you weren't created to sit. You were created to work. Can't, come on, we all have experienced this, right? We've actually worked with somebody who was lazy. Has anybody worked with somebody that was lazy before? Oh, my goodness. What does that do? Well, that means you have to work harder to do their job because they're sitting back doing nothing. Has anybody worked for somebody like that? Is anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. All of this is important to recognize. Why? Why? Because when you're working and you're working with these people, the fact is, is that you're expecting them to do their responsibility because when they do their part of the work, it fulfills your part of the work. I talked to somebody not too long ago, and they're working on a line, on a, on a manufacturer's line, and the guy in front of him is lazy, doesn't do anything, and he has to do twice the work at his station. Why? Well, because if he doesn't, it can't go to the next station. So it has to be completely. Completed. And man, the bosses are watching him and saying, you're doing a phenomenal job. I want you to realize this. Some of you are challenged in your relationship with the Lord because God is challenging you to do good works. He's challenging you to work for him. He's challenging you to do the talents and the gifts that he's given you to help other people that, that they may know Christ. But you're challenged with God because you're refusing to step in. You see, we have not been just created in his image. We're not just his workmanship, but his workmanship has a purpose. His workmanship is that we will create and do good works. Now, I love the final part of that scripture. It says this, which God prepared beforehand for that, that we should walk in them. So before you and I were ever created, before he said, let there be Robert, and there was Robert. Before he said, let there be Cody, and there was Cody. Before he said, let there be Lenny, and there was Lenny. Before he ever said, let there be June, and there was June. Before he ever said, let there be Leslie, and before there was Leslie. God said this. I've got a plan for them. I've got a purpose for them. I've got a destiny for them. It's not survival. It's not thriving. It's fulfilling. And God has within you already programmed that design so that you will do what God's will is for his life through you. You're so important, and the world dismisses us. There are more people struggling with low self-esteem. I want you to realize you don't have to have low self-esteem. You've got to have God esteem because when you know who you are in Christ, there's nothing that you cannot accomplish. But when you start comparing yourself or trying to look at what you could have done, be who God has called you to be, and you'll be the happiest person on the planet. Say amen. You see, this is the plan of heaven. And when we're going to the next level, you've got to grab a hold of this because Jesus did too. I want to remind you that Jesus, he was before the earth ever was. The book of John chapter 1 says that Jesus was at creation and nothing was created without him. But remember that Jesus did not have a physical body until he was birthed by Mary. Matthew chapter 1, we see that Mary becomes, she was a virgin, becomes impregnated by the Holy Spirit. That God took the God seed and put it in a flesh body so that Jesus Christ could come and live as the Redeemer that he was called to be. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus gave up all of his heavenly glory to come down here and live as a man. Why? So that he could be a Messiah according to Hebrews that understands all that we go through. So here, Jesus, I want you to realize he is God. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three yet. Come on now. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three yet. Come on. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three yet. Come on, you need rock solid faith. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three yet. One. So Jesus is God, but yet he knew. See, Adam and Eve created and, and, and did what was called high treason. 
What they did was they chose to disobey the Lord in the Garden of, in the Garden of Eden. And it severed a relationship. You see, that's what sin does. Sin always severs relationship with God. That's why the Holy Spirit works so desperately to convict you of your sin. Because when there's sin there, there's separation between you and the Lord. And so here Adam and Eve committed high treason. And they were thrown out of the garden. And here God had a plan already. That's what I love about my Lord. Nothing surprises God. I want you to know some of you are going through hard times and you're wondering where God is. God wasn't surprised when it ended up on your doorstep. God didn't go, ooh, that's a bad situation. No, God knew. And God says, I have a plan. There's nothing impossible for those who believe. I can call and do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want you to know you're not in survival mode, but with God on your side, you are more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus our Lord. God was not surprised by anything, even Adam and Eve. And so God had a plan put together. And this is what I love about him. You're part of the plan. Turn to somebody and say, you're part of that plan. That's right. Come on, tell somebody you're part of that plan. You see, that's the exciting part about the gospel. That's the exciting part about our God, is that you and I, just like Jesus, is part of the plan. But Christ had to make a decision. He had to come down, and he had to, he had to willfully give up all of his heavenly glory. He had to come down and willfully walk as a man. He had to willfully choose not to sin, and he had to willfully die. You see, this is the powerful part about all of our lives. All of our lives are wrapped up in choice. Everything about our life is choice. You can't blame your circumstances. You can't blame mommy and daddy. My mother threw away my creamer. I can't blame her for the problems in my life. <laughs> Say amen. amen. I can't blame the government. I can't blame the government. Amen. If the government was the answer, then we'd already be fixed. If education was the answer, we'd all be fixed. We can go through the list of things that we blame because of our situations, but the facts come down to this. It always comes down to the choice. See, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to remind you about the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a place that was filled with emotional torment. Jesus went and he started to pray, God, if there's any other way. Now, let me tell you, this was so intense that when he started to pray, drops of blood came out of his pores. We're not talking about, you know, like he just prayed, oh, Lord, please, Jesus. No, no, this was so intense. This was so emotional. This was so impactful that as he prayed, the emotions took over. I want you to hear me now that Jesus Christ had to make a choice in the Garden of Gethsemane whether he was going to go to the cross or not. Ready? Whether he was going to fulfill his purpose and his destiny and direction from heaven pre-programmed in his life, he had a choice to make right there in the garden. Some of you have been to that garden before. And your choices haven't been to fulfill God's will. Your choices have been to fulfill the appetite that you have in your soul. And you're ending up back at the, at the garden again. You see, what I love about God is God doesn't give up on us. Even when we make bad choices, has anybody ever made a bad choice before? Even when we make bad choices, God will keep bringing us back around. God will keep bringing us back to that place of choice. God will keep bringing us back and say, hey, I'm not giving up on you. Hey, I'm giving you the direction. Hey, I'm giving you the grace. Hey, I'm giving you the power to fulfill the very purpose of your life. That's why we're here. Purpose. How many people are lost in the body of Christ? They've got no purpose in life. They come to church, they sit their fanny in a chair, usually the same chair they usually sit in, so now it has their imprint. <laughs> they throw George Washington in the plate, go home. There's real no, no reason, there's no real purpose. It's, it's just kind of, well, I'm kind of here and I'm doing my best and I'm hoping to make it to heaven, but God's plan is not for you just to get to heaven. If God's plan was only for you to get to heaven, when you got saved, you'd die. But you're alive today because God's got a plan for your life. God's got a purpose for your life. God's got destiny for your life. God has said, 
I made you with the work of my hands. I put within you a job and I'm giving you, before you ever knew it, the power, the talent, the gifts, and the abilities to fulfill what I need you for right now in this year, right now in 2019, beckoning on the threshold of 2020. God has a plan for your life. There's nothing more fulfilling than doing his will. There's nothing more satisfying than knowing that he's happy with you. And there's nothing more dissatisfying when you realize you're not pleasing God. I think the weird part is there are a lot of people in between that. They're not sure if they are or not. Because they've never taken the time to realize how important their lives are. Therefore, they've never focused on what God's purpose is for them. This is where we've got to have this transition in our spiritual life before we crest into 2020. And I've got great news. as God gave me the, the word for 2020 back in the month of October. I was talking to the bishop the other day and asked what, his, what, what God had been speaking to him. And exactly what God had been speaking to us is exactly what God's been speaking to him and to other pastors that I know of across the country. The God of creation, the God of next level, the God of the supernatural is the same God speaking here as he is all over the nation. And you'll find that God wants to take you on the adventure of the supernatural so that you will fulfill the very destiny of your life and not sit back and live a life of regret because you just kind of went to church. Amen. Say amen or oh my. Amen. See, this is what God's plan is for you. Jesus had to choose that day. Not my will, but yours. It's a hard one, isn't it? Let's be real. When you have a choice to sin or not to sin, it's more satisfying to the flesh to sin than not to sin until after you've sinned. Because then the conviction of the Holy Spirit is strong. And then you have another choice. Do I respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit or do I override the Holy Spirit, break down that roadblock and just get my heart hardened? Every one of us have the same choices in life. I was teaching a leadership course one time and one of the examples were two brothers. Two brothers brought up in the same household. The same exact teaching. Both of them, because of the impartation from their father, both had bad tempers. And they both had the same choices. One of them chose to lose his temper and beat somebody, and he got arrested and put in jail. The other brother made a decision that I am not going to allow my temper to rule me and to own me, but I will learn how to control it. Same people. Same growth, same impartation, different choices. Our choices change everything. Some of you have made choices, and some of us have made choices in this room that are just, you sit back and you go, what in the world did I do? How do I fix this? Is there any way out? Can I recover from this? I've got great news for you. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That mess up didn't even surprise God. He knew it was coming before you got there. He's just waiting for you to get up. Come on now. What did he say to Peter? The devil wants to sift you as wheat, but I want you to know I'm praying for you. And when you get up, encourage the brethren. I love what Paul said. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press on towards the mark of the high call. Come on now. You didn't surprise God. God was not shocked, but God wants you to get up and start moving again. Amen. You see, this is where you and I make our choices. 
And the choices aren't singular because Christ made the choice in the garden, but then he was on the tree. I want to remind you that this is not just a nice little fable or fairy tale, but they beat the living crap out of him so bad. Oh, come on now. Some of you have heard the description of exactly what had happened. They started punching him. They started beating him. His face started to swell. If you've ever been punched in the face, you know what I'm talking about. But it wasn't just one guy. It was at least 50 soldiers beating him in the face, punching him in the face, spitting at him. Man, big loogies hitting him right near his mouth, right in his eyes. I'm talking how nasty, you know how nasty that is. Has anybody ever spit in your face? You know what it feels like. Man, that's gross. But they were spitting in Christ's face. Then they were beating him with their fists. And then what they did was they literally reached up and they grabbed his beard and they started tearing it out of his face. They started mocking him. I want to remind you who God is, who Christ is. Christ is God. They took a flagellum, which is like a cat of nine tails, and they started beating his back so bad, the Bible says, excuse me, that even history declares and medical science declares that literally they could see his bowels from the exterior. They put a robe on his back and tore it off after the, after the blood had dried. They took a crown of thorns and drove it into his head. There were about two to two and a half inch thorns that were driven into his scalp. All of this was happening. Man, I want you to realize that Christ had made the choice. I love what he made the declaration of here in the book of, of John chapter 10, verse 18. No man took my life. I gave my life. They took five to seven inch spikes and drove them through his wrists, through his heels. His tongue started to swell. His eyeballs started to, 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 to uh, get to the place where now every time you blinked, it felt like sandpaper. Who is that on the cross? It is Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. The one at any moment of time could have called out and legions of angels would have come and delivered him off the tree. But yet Hebrews says he counted it all joy when he died on the cross. See, he had to make a choice. Do I choose to complete God's will for my life? Or do I choose to get off the tree? I don't know about you. I, I don't think I've ever been put in, I, I know, I've never been put in that kind of position. It's workmanship. Created for good works. Which God foreordained before you were ever created, before Jesus ever took the earth, before Christ ever came into Mary's belly, before Christ ever was birthed, before Christ ever walked on the planet with his brothers and sisters and mother and father, before he ever walked with the disciples, before he ever went into ministry, before he ever went into the garden, before he ever went on the tree, before he ever gave up the ghost, before he ever rose from the dead, God foreordained the good works just like he has for you. You and I, we're not an accident. He's got a plan for you. And in 2019, this year of next level, we're constantly being, we're constantly being, uh, we're, uh, I want to say, aggressively addressed on change. Not everybody likes change. Who here likes change? Awesome. You're all on staff. Do you want to know why? People, no one likes change. We all want our comfort. We all want our bed. We went down to see Brother Ted Shuttlesworth this week. Uh, my wife and I went down for three days, and we were down in West Virginia spending time with Brother Ted and Sister Bonnie. And we stayed at the Fairfield Inn. Now, I usually like the Fairfield Inn. And uh, their beds are usually comfortable, but their pillows are horrible. Has anybody ever, they're horrible pillows. How many of you like, like, big, thick, fluffy pillows? I mean, the bigger, the fluffy, the better. How many of you like the thin, 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 thin ones that you can roll up in like a mat? I like the thin, thin, thin ones. They don't make them there. 
So I'm waking up rolling all night long, rolling all night. I couldn't wait to get home to my bed. It's comfortable. But we had a purpose for going there. We had a reason for going there. We had a destiny for going there. We had a design to go there. And even though things were uncomfortable, even though I'd rather been at home, especially during the ice storm on the way back driving, even though all of that was there, there was a purpose. And if I chose comfort over choosing destiny, then something would be lost. Whew, I sense the anointing. Jesus chose destiny over comfort because he saw you, because he loves you, because he desires you. Every one of us are in that same zone. 2019, coming to a close. Is it my desires or his desires? Is it my life or his life? Do I want my destiny or do I want his destiny? Can I tell you, I think, I don't know if I said it this service or last, I'm lost a little. You will never be in the happiest position if you're not in the will of God. You will be, you can make all the money in the world you want and you'll be miserable. Why? Because if that's not God's will for your life, you can't be happy. But if you are in God's will for your life, if the workman who created you, designed you, placed you in history, and then has plans for you, and you're walking in the way that he's called you to do, there is a fulfillment in your spirit that man, that money, that medicine, that people, that sex, that drugs, nothing can fulfill but Jesus. But if you're not there, man, all those other things are options for you. Because you need them. Because there's a gap and a, and a hole in your life. Choice is so powerful. Why are you here? Why are you here? I'm not talking church. I'm talking why are you here on this planet? What is God's plan for your life? Why are there breath? Why is there breath in your lungs? Why some people live in their 90s and 100 years old? My grandmother died at 101 years old. Why did she die at 101? Man, because she was dancing before God at 97, sharing the gospel with people. Every one of us got choices to make. And, and one of the trials of being a pastor, you don't mind me being a little transparent. I've had to ask myself the why of pastoring more than once. What many of you don't know, I think we shared this years ago, but we went through a trial where we had some really powerful Judas kisses all in one year. What I didn't know is my wife actually went and found a job in Florida and a house. And she was done. Boy, it sounded pretty good to me too. By the way, that means you wouldn't be sitting here because it wouldn't be this building. And we had to sit back and my fight was not with her. My fight was with, I got a problem here now. My problem is that sounds really good. Nobody likes to be hurt. Say amen or oh my. Nobody likes to have people uh, lie about you. Nobody likes to have people stab you in the back. Nobody likes to have people go around and try to wound you and hurt you. No one likes that. And pastors are no different. So we were making choices. My fight was not with her. My fight was not even with the idea. My fight was with God because I know my why. My why is in Horseheads, New York. My why is preaching the gospel. My why is because I love you. My why is because I'm obeying God. My why, and when I get to heaven, all the worth can pass away. But one thing I'll know is that I fulfilled my why and why I was here on this planet at this time and in this season. And I refuse to have regret in my life. I know my why.
What's your why? Why are you still breathing? Why are you here? What is God's plan for your life? Why? You can have all the stuff, but with no why, it still don't make sense. Or you can have your why and have stuff and everything's good. In that, knowing your why allows you to be a person of destiny. Allows you to be a person that's going to bring change. My life and your life is not about saved or savings. It's about spending. I've been created to be spent. You've been created to be spent. That others can come to your tree and eat the fruit that he placed on you. And to God be the glory, great things he has done. But when you don't know your why, how can you know how to plant? And then when you know your why and choose you, how many people don't get to eat? I think that's one of the most powerful thoughts is realizing that not one person in this room is an island to themselves. I'm in the driveway, as you know, on Sunday mornings. I'm almost done. You're really blessed, and I'll tell you why you're blessed. Because when I came this morning, I had two sermons. This one I got on Thursday, and then I got one on Saturday, and I wasn't sure which one God wanted me to preach. So if God didn't speak to me, I was going to preach both of them. So you're really blessed, because Pastor Andre in 7.15 a.m. prayer, uh, the Lord revealed which sermon to preach. So you're, you, listen, it's only a two-hour sermon now instead of just the three. I'm on the driveway this morning, and a car pulls up. And, you know, people roll down their windows, and I'm waving at everybody. And, and uh, there was a girl in the back seat, and I went, hey, how are you? She goes, I'm thinking, this is interesting. I said, how are you? And she said, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't like people. <laughs> Listen now, I understand. Because sometimes it's hard to love people. Sometimes it's hard to like people. I had a staff member that didn't like people. She told me, I hate people, but I love preaching the word. And it's like, I don't always like people either, but I got to make a decision in my heart. Some people are nasty. Say amen or oh my. Some people are just downright mean. Say amen or oh my. Some people, man, you know the devil hangs out at their house and talks to them. <laughs> but I had to make a choice, just like you have to make a choice. Without you, someone's not going to heaven. You know that, right? Without you, someone's not going to hear the gospel. Without you, a family could split up. Without you, someone's going to die of a sickness and a disease. Without you, someone's going to commit suicide. Without you, someone's going to have absolutely everything the world has to offer with no hope. Without you, God's plan can't come. I always pick on Dean because I love Dean. Dean lives in the town of Breezeport. Come here, Dean. <laughs> Dean has long hair. I wish I had. You have more hair than I have. Yeah. I live where it's colder. <laughs> you do not. <laughs> Dean is a trapper. Dean was a really good sinner. Yeah. <laughs> no one had ever thought Dean would have ever given his heart to Jesus. True. Right. Right. You're from a unique family. Yeah. <laughs> a real unique. A good sinner family. Yeah, that's about right. 
I didn't have a father growing up. No dad. But you gave your heart to Jesus. Yeah. Yes, I did. Were you shocked you gave your heart to Jesus? Um, no, I mean, I felt from the, it was inside of me and he told me to, so I did. So you did. Was anybody else shocked you got saved? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Everybody was shocked I got saved. I have, I have no friends outside of here. They, all his friends left him. Yeah. Why? Because he gave his heart to Jesus. That's right. But this dude here, when we're doing anything for the gospel, he lives right in Breezeport. He goes across there, and he talks to all the people. They're, they're doing gasoline, you know, at the gas station there. Where can they go? Dean is getting them, sharing the gospel with them. Dean is inviting them to church. Dean is loving on them. Dean is talking to his neighbors. Dean is bringing them to church. Dean is bringing their kids to church if they don't want to come. Do we ever really know how many lives were changed because Dean chose Jesus and chose to be his workmanship created for good works in Christ? Can I just say thank you? I love you, Dean. Love you, too. My question to you, what is your why? And what are you willing to change for your why? Because you're going to have to make a choice someday. Do you choose Jesus? Or do you choose you? I pray you choose Jesus. Why? Because if Dean gets, didn't get saved, how, how do we know how many people have now changed because Dean gave his heart to Jesus?